Okay, we want to just have a brief uh, introduction to the iron carbon phase diagram. And some of this is just a good review of what's going on in the phase diagrams in general. So, uh, but there's a lot of new vocabulary. So you need to know what hypoeutectoid, hypoeutectoid, proeutectoid, perlite are. Um, you should be able to pull the major phases off the iron carbon diagram. And uh, if I give you an alloy, you should be able to identify the proeutectoid phase. And that'll all make sense for you. So here's the iron carbon diagram. And if you look at this, there's a couple of important V's present here, right? There's uh, this upward V, and that's a U, right? Liquid above, two solids below, so there's a eutectic. And this is an important eutectic commercially because as we add carbon to iron, we suppress the melting temperature from about 1540 um, down here to about 1150, so 400 degrees roughly. That's worth a lot of uh, natural gas or electricity if you're melting it. So cast irons involve um, high carbon contents to take advantage of eutectic here. The other V here is another U, right? It's above. It's a, a U reaction, but it's all solids, austenite to ferrite and graphite, or we're going to more commonly say ferrite cementite. One going to two, that's a eutectoid. It's all entirely solid. And this is at the heart of the heat treating of steel. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that uh, in the next lecture and class period. But what we need to do today is get some basic terminology squared away. So uh, there's your eutectic here and your eutectoid there. Um, notice that uh, the austenite or single phase uh, version here runs out to about 2% carbon. And the low temperature morph, this is your FCC iron, and here's your BCC iron, ferrite. The low temperature morph has a very, very poor solubility, only about 0.02%, as we'll see in some other diagrams. So what are these phases? Ferrite, alpha iron, iron with very little carbon, moderately hard, decent material uh, for hardness. But it's BCC, and so it has limited ductility. Austenite is FCC iron, has a lot of carbon, and is quite ductile because of its FCC nature, which is why we form iron usually uh, at high temperature in the austenite state. And then cementite is an intermediate compound, has limited ductility. It's Fe3C is the chemical name. So here's zoomed in on the part of the phase diagram that is most useful to us. Um, not going to 100% carbon, that doesn't help us with too much. The right boundary here is Fe3C, which is an intermediate compound. It exists at 6.7 weight percent carbon, exactly. And uh, remember, intermediate compound is a phase that has existence, pure existence only at one composition. Now, the eutectoid temperature is really critical, and steels are broken into two families. Steels that have less carbon than the eutectoid amount are called hypo-eutectoids as in hypodermic needle or hypothermia, below the temperature the body's supposed to have, or below the skin, hypodermic. And hypereutectoids have more carbon than the eutectoid amount. All right, so hypo and hyper tell you whether you're to the left or to the right of the eutectoid composition. So the eutectoid is uh, about 0.77 uh, weight percent. So a 1090 steel has 0.9%, uh, it's going to be hyper, and the 1040 steel has 0.4%, it's going to be hypo. All right, two-phase region, single-phase region. There's actually another single-phase region up here called delta iron. It's body center cubic again, but it's not of much commercial interest because it's only at really high temperatures. So let's zoom in, and let's ask what happens if a, we take a sample of material and we start it in the austenite state and we cool it slowly. Remember, this is an equilibrium diagram, so we have to cool really, really slowly okay, to, uh, to allow equilibrium structures to form. So as we cool down, we hit the uh, boundary of the ferrite and austenite region. Remember, ferrite is this little wedge here, austenite on the right. So two-phase region, and so we're going to begin to make ferrite. And as we move through this region, as we cool, we're going to make progressively more and more ferrite. Now where is that ferrite going to form? Well, it's going to form 
on grain boundaries. So at point B, we're going to have, uh, at point A, we'll start to make little ferrite nodules at the boundaries. And by the time we get to point B, we will have made uh, ferrite regions all along the boundaries of the grains. Now you can estimate how much ferrite you've made. How do we do that? And you should be saying to yourself, reverse lever law, reverse lever law. If you're not, you can go back and review phase diagrams. Um, so remember, reverse lever law tells me the proportions of the phases present. So if I ask how much ferrite, well, then I need reverse lever law, so opposite length of the lever. So 0.52 to 0.77 is about 0.25. And this total lever is 0.02 to 0.77, so it's about 0.75. So this length is 0.25, the total is 0.75. So we've made about a third of the material is turned into ferrite, and the remaining two-thirds is austenite. Now when we cross the eutectoid line to point D, we just get below this line. And notice this is a two-phase region, ferrite and perlite. Well, what is perlite? Perlite is a mixture of ferrite and cementite. And what happens is when you force the remaining austenite to convert to ferrite, that austenite at, at, uh, at point C is going to hold 0.77% carbon. If you do your tie line at point C, how much carbon is in the austenite? 0.77. How much is in the ferrite? 0.02. So that, there's lots of room for the carbon in the austenite. But when you cool the tenth of a degree or just a teeny bit below the eutectoid, suddenly, wait a minute, we've got no, we've got what's going on here, right? There's no austenite to absorb all of that carbon. So what's going to happen is we're going to form a new phase. And if you go back to remember back to the larger diagram, what is the boundary? My tie line will come all the way over here to 6.7 weight percent carbon in the cementite. Okay, in this Fe3C that forms. So I'm going to have two phases, ferrite and cementite, where the ferrite is very poor in carbon and cementite is extremely rich in carbon. And so I get a little bit of cementite takes up the carbon in a lot of austenite because the, ratio, the, the relative concentrations are so different. So that forms this structure we call perlite. And perlite is the equilibrium structure that forms in a Displacive transformation where the crystal structure is changing with where there's a concentration problem, where there's a solubility limit. And we have to separate out one of the species and form a, a, a uh, in this case, carbon-rich phase uh, and a carbon-poor phase. Now you'll hear perlite used to refer to other microstructures and other alloy families. And all they mean is that the alloy, when it is cooled through some transformation, forms this two component phase that is lamellar in structure and so they will call it perlite as well. Um, perlite obviously when we talk about iron carbon refers to this particular lamellar structure that we get. Now proeutectoid is the new big word we need to deal with here. Where did this fer we have ferrite that formed here at the nuclei at the grains and that grew along the grain boundaries that formed before the eutectoid temperature was crossed. And then in the perlite, there's ferrite between the cementite lamella. As the last of the austenites separated, carbon diffused into cementite-rich regions and left behind uh, carbon-rich regions of cementite and left behind carbon-poor regions of ferrite to make this lamellar layered structure. So I have ferrite in the perlite, and I have ferrite that formed before the perlite. This ferrite on the grains is called pro-eutectoid ferrite. It formed before the eutectoid, and the ferrite in the grains is called eutectoid ferrite. It formed at the eutectoid temperature. All right. So this is a, let's go back to our diagram. This is a 0.52 weight percent carbon steel. It is below the eutectoid in composition, so this is a hypo-eutectoid steel. And the pro-eutectoid phase in a hypo-eutectoid steel is ferrite. It's what forms before we cross the eutectoid. Now, at the eutectoid, what's the pro-eutectoid phase? Well, there is none. 
cool down. You have austenite, you have austenite, bingo, you have perlite. There is no pro-eutectoid phase at the eutectoid. It's a very simple structure. And in fact, there's your a micrograph of eutectoid steel. And so the perlite follows the grain boundaries of the austenite, and it's broken up. Each, per, each austenite grain is broken up into cementite lamella in the white matrix is ferrite. Now what happens if we have a hyper-eutectoid steel? Let me go back to the phase diagram. What happens if my carbon content is higher than 0.77%? That means I'm going to cool down in this region. What's in that region? Well, that's the cementite region, isn't it? Alpha plus Fe3, uh, gamma plus Fe3C here. So my pro-eutectoid phase in a hyper-eutectoid steel will be cementite. And it's going to form along the grain boundaries just like the ferrite does in the hypo. But in the hyper material, this is cementite. And the only reason we know it's cementite is because we happen to know it's a hyper-eutectoid steel. All right. So I have cementite along the boundaries. That's the pro-eutectoid cementite. And I have cementite in the grains. That is the eutectoid cementite. And then I only have ferrite that formed at the eutectoid, none formed before the eutectoid temperature. Now, why do we add carbon to steel? Why do we play with, why do we need to play with this whole range of the iron carbon phase diagram? And let's just finish with this. We've talked about um, you cannot alter the modulus of steel very much because you're talking about stretching iron-iron bonds. But you can dramatically alter the strength of steel. And we've talked already about strain hardening, um, adding dislocations, about grain refinement. And we mentioned in passing that you can alloy. And here is the effect of alloying on the properties of your steel. Um, yield strengths running up um, significantly here. And you get dramatic increases in tensile strength. Okay, we're talking factors of four, um, approximately, possible by adding carbon. And so um, dramatic effects possible, and, uh, and therefore they're interested in adding carbon. Um, what, what that's going to do, though, is going to fundamentally alter the microstructures that we get. And of course, it's the microstructures that are producing this hardness. So we need a tool to help us with uh, rates of cooling, rates of heating that are um, not equilibrium. And we've emphasized in all this equilibrium diagram stuff that this has to happen incredibly slowly. But practically speaking, you cannot cool parts coming out of a furnace uh, for, for weeks on end to get them to make the equilibrium structure. We're going to cool quickly, and, and the, the equilibrium phase diagram is not going to help us with that. So we need another tool, and so our next discussion will be on time temperature transformation diagrams and how we manage realistic cooling rates, the effect that has on microstructure, and then the effect that microstructure has on the final properties of the alloys that we're working with.